Fred the Fire, welcome back to SMWX. And today I'm really excited to be joined by one of South Africa's most esteemed journalists, an editor of various publications, and one of the senior figures on the South African journalistic landscape, Ferial Hafiji. Thanks so much for joining us on SMWX. Thank you, Cesar. Really excited to be here. Extremely excited, Thank likewise. You. And you were the first person to ever publish something that I wrote. What did I? Yeah. What was it? Yeah, it was um, it was before the 2014 election, mm -hmm. and um, I predicted that South African politics would split into three polls, mm -hmm. and uh, you published it in City Press, and I was so excited. And you were right. Well, hey, I don't want to say, but <laughs> you can always go back and read. And then after that, you won the City Press Nonfiction Prize. Eh? That's right. That is excellent. Yeah, eh? yeah, yeah. So great to be with you. Thank you. Great to now publish this interview. Thank you. I, I really look forward to it. Eh? Yeah. And just to say, I'm really excited by what you're doing. I think it's young, owned, um, 21st century media, and it's really lovely to see. I mm? appreciate that. Mm. We, we look forward to further advice mm. from you. You know, I wanted to chat to you for a number of reasons. Partly because the public discourse, especially the way it works on social media, is becoming a serious problem. And in some ways we come from different perspectives, but just normal conversations seem to have left the building sure. in South African politics. But also just because you have really fascinating views on the media as a whole. And what one thing I didn't know is that you are a labor reporter by trade. That's yes. really your area of interest. Yes. Mm. So let's start there. We've mm. got an unemployment crisis on our hands. How do you view this crisis? What do you think are its implications? And mm. how do you think we should look at this, this sure. crisis? So I'll, I'll go back a little bit and share with you about how I became a labor reporter. Mm. So um, I'm the child of clothing workers. Both my parents were in the what was then called the garment industry. Mm. And so I saw the role that trade unions could have in lives that were very, very precariously loved. Mm. I mean, if it, if it hadn't been for what was then the Garment Workers Union, my father would have had absolutely no support for any kind of medical assistance, for any kind of assistance with advice as the clothing industry went to the wall. Mm. So I was really somebody who, who grew up in that milieu, and it, it was very instinctive for me to become a labor reporter, hmm. to understand the lives of working people. And I did it for very many years. And now what saddens me, if you look at our discourse, at the fierce nature of our politics, mm. where our country is, is I think we tend to make a molehill out of a mountain of a problem, which is unemployment. Mm. People mm. who simply are never going to know a working life, even of the kind that my parents had. Mm. And for me, the politics crowds out proper coverage of the labor market, mm. which really is one that I need, I think is layered and requires far more attention than our horror whenever the statistics come out, mm. but then we forget about it until the next statistics come out in three months' mm. time. Mm. That's so true. You know, we, we get opinions via voice notes on yes. our channel, and it's fascinating to see how much this issue comes up, even though it's not at the forefront of, let's say, a mainstream yes. agenda. Mm. How do you think we report on this better? How do you think we bring this back to the forefront mm. Um, mm. and avoid some of the distractions of the political theater that often you know, consume sure. us? Um, so I've thought about this a lot and, and I feel like in the same way like the Rand dollar exchange rate, what the JSE closed on, mm. those indices that determine the pattern of our thinking life about business and the economy must begin to include two things. I think you have to put every day your unemployment level right up there. Mm. And these days it's not on the masthead of a newspaper. It could be tweeted. It could be what do you consider to be headline news? What are the leading indices sure. of our nation? Sure. And then like The Guardian has done, it's begun to put CO2 levels mm. um, as, a, as a crucial part of how it, it's put it on the weather pages. Mm. And I heard the editor-in-chief saying she didn't think it belongs there. But I think that's how you keep um, these kind of vital figures right mm. at the top of our imaginations mm. um, as a country and as a people. Um, uh, things that have crossed my mind, it, it would be very nice to do a diary of an unemployed person, make them a character mm. of national life, go mm. back and back and back just to, to track for everybody what does it feel like to not have a job, 
to keep looking as a young person and to just find this labor market that has no entry points for you, no on-ramps for you. Mm. And what does that feel like? And then I suppose to, to seed hope in us is to look at a place like the Har Harambe Employment Accelerator and understand what it's going to take to get young people into work. Because I think those are the fundamentals. I'd, be, I'd much rather do that, but instead I find my days like public protector report, mm, mm. Um, the presidency, the latest fight within the ANC, sure. the tripartite alliance. And mm. that's what I mean when I say our politics is all consuming and it crowds out attention to the really, mm. really important things. I think one of the interesting ways that that plays out in the current moment we find ourselves yes. in is, is on social media, because mm. this has become a venue for many of these political debates sure. to gain an, an airing, mm. and quite a skewed airing in, in, on both sides of different divides. Sure. And I think we haven't done enough thinking about how the algorithms on social media, you know, the recipes about what we get served, actually create and deepen the divisions in our society as opposed to produce productive conversations. Sure. Mm. What are your thoughts on algorithmic justice and how social media may in fact becoming, be becoming a, a force for division rather than creation? So let me go back a little bit. I mean, I started working just as typewriters went out, so that oh, was a really wow. long time ago, <laughs> and still have stuffy disks um, wow. and, and disk-operated systems. Um, so for me, social media has been such a liberator. Mm. Um, a liberator personally as a journalist, in that I no longer need a commercial platform. It is a commercial platform, sure, sure. but I no longer be need to be employed anywhere in order to have an opinion and mm. to reach an audience. Mm. Um, to see what other people are thinking has been so vital for, it's almost become a part of my lifeblood as a journalist. Yeah. I think it's been a fundamentally democratizing moment because you can be called out. The conversation is no longer one way. Mm. As an editor and a journalist, I no longer control the conversation. Oh, that's for sure. That's great and it's <laughs> important. I think it's, it's much more diverse. It's much more seeded everywhere. Mm. On the other hand, I've seen its dark side coming into view. Yeah. Where social media can often, one, like you said, it can make for a hostile and um, binary debate in our country. It can make us feel like we're at war when we aren't. And the third thing, it hosts a massive disinformation exercise, mm. um, not only here, but internationally. So we've seen with regards to Brexit, the exit of Britain from Europe, and we've seen with the election of Donald Trump in the U.S., those two massive phenomenon of our life in the world um, has been the result of disinformation mm. campaigns. Not the only thing that caused them, but disinformation played a very, very large part sure. in that. Sure. Um, you know, I think so. Both yeah. extreme light and then mm. real risk to the democratic edifice. And mm. and of course at home. And, you know, and I mean, at you home were too. on the mm. receiving end of some very vicious disinformation campaigns. Yes. Um, in the Bell Pottinger era, sure. um, because you've decided to criticize people in the ANC, people in the EFF, people in the DA, various forms of those armies sure. come for you at different times. What's that like as a journalist in South Africa? Mm. What toll does that take on on you working as a journalist? So um, the first time I, I realized that this was organized campaigning was um, Wandley Makanya, um, then the ed editor of City Press, I had already left to go and do my own thing. He asked me to do a big feature for him called Four Days in December. Okay. And he asked me to track what had happened over the four days when Nklantla Nene was fired as finance minister, mm. when Des Van Rooyen was brought in and became the weekend special, when the markets tanked and really we were in a deep moment of crisis. So a year later, he said to me, give me a double page spread on what happened over those four days. Mm. So I went and I very carefully investigated and tracked, um, worked out the role of Salim Essa, the lieutenant of the Gupta family, worked out which was the individual bits of the family, how they fit together, how mm. they gained prominence, how they gained influence. 
published the piece and on the following Monday morning there were images of me on Twitter as a gargoyle, as a prostitute, mm. as a, a cheerleader, um, naked in the bed of Johan van Rupert, you mm. know, sorry, Johan Rupert, yeah. then on his lap. And that's when I started studying the phenomenon and understanding disinformation campaigns. Mm. Later, of course, the investigative work made me realize, made all of us realize it was actually Bell Pottinger, the global uh, multinational. They mm. had done this kind of thing in Iraq. They had done it around the world, but they got caught here because we have a very activist uh, sure. Twitter community, like we have an activist society. Mm. Um, and then since then, it really hasn't stopped. Yeah? Yeah. So this can be in the form of organized trolling armies. These are This is where powerful politicians um, hire people, pay them to click. And this you can see in, it happens in Mexico, it happens in Turkey, it happens in the Philippines, all around the world where you have large mm. unemployed tech savvy uh, groups of people. Yeah. You can hire a trolling army. Do you think it's happening here? I do think it's happening here. We're about to do some uh, uh, studies on, on exactly where it's happening mm. and how it's happening. And then you can have a paid trolling army or you can have an unpaid um, organic one that's just related to the power of the politician yeah. in office. And I do think we're seeing that across parties. Yeah. Um, the ANC yeah. has them, the DA has them, and the EFF has the most powerful mm. of them. Eh? Um, that's, that's really interesting. I, I mm. also experienced this when I was doing um, Roads Must Fall in Oxford. Sure. And this became an international, you know, furore. And suddenly, and this was very much at the time of Brexit and as the mm -hmm. Trump phenomenon was starting to boil, just feeling this coordinated assault from all these right-wing mm. bots. When just, you were taking Roads Must Fall yeah, to Oxford. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. And it, it had a different feeling, you know, people disagree on Twitter, but yes. this was just like, daily yes you yes. know tens of people just constantly like really bitterly mm. attacking mm. and i think one of the difficult parts of this is and this is my view in the twitter the algorithm remains a mystery mm. but i think what happens is that engagement drives the platform and what builds engagement you seeing something that really presses your buttons sure. and getting angry and so i think trolling armies become invisible to the opposite side you know so i think eff leaders let me say are on the receiving end of an eff supporters on twitter on the receiving end of some of the worst right wing you know trolling armies sure which are now invisible to the eff supporters on twitter who are also an opposing sure trolling mm. army maybe attacking a journalist mm. who's criticized mm. the EFF and and so each side let's that's just one battle in our society you know there are many between the DA between different parts of yes. the ANC each side only sees their trolls for sure and therefore thinks that they don't have trolls mm. also working on their behalf mm. do you see do you see where I'm going with that it, it's, it's this invisibility yeah. of mm. of the harms that are supporting your mm. side and only seeing the harms that are. Sure. Yeah. I suppose it's that kind of phenomenon which means that Twitter's Jack Dorsey, which means that mm. Ma uh, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, um, which means that Amazon's Jeff Bezos, they're being held to an account that you've yeah. never seen before. I think mm. for the beginning of the lives of those uh, technological giants, all we did was treat them like demigods because they had built these amazing platforms mm. which have changed all of our lives completely. Yeah. I mean, your channel wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the brilliance of sure. the programming of WhatsApp. But I suppose what we all now are seeing, like any growth of a powerful phenomenon in the world, that it will have a negative side. Mm. And the challenge for us as, um, as people in democracies, because it's a little bit more difficult if you're in an autocratic authoritarian state, is yeah. how do you mediate that power? And what you're talking about, I think, is a much more self-conscious decision mm. that instead of being caught in this bubble and only existing in it and looking for likes, mentions, mm. clicks, etc., mm. it's going to take an act of self-discipline 
and self-knowledge to go and explore the other yeah, side. Absolutely. And that's why I'm not sure that, that um, this exploration or deeper conversation or trying to find the human being in you and have a proper conversation, mm. I don't think it's going to happen on Twitter Oh yeah. or I, I, on I, Facebook. <laughs> um, I do think it's going to happen yeah. like we're sitting here and talking mm. to each mm -hmm. other now. Huh? Well, on that, now that yes. we've discussed the big issues, let's let's get to some of the of the you know political dramas sure. that, that befall us i think mm. if someone looked at twitter they would probably see us as two completely opposing you know people i've been extremely critical of the new dawn you to varying extents have supported sure. it mm. but like we don't hate each other you know mm. what i mean we just have a different view or yeah. had a different view mm. and, and sometimes our views have converged and sometimes they diverge sure mm. um what do you think right now is the state of the Ramaphosa presidency? And how do you analyze what's happening with the public protector in relation to the project and the, the promise of the Ramaphosa presidency? Sure. Um, so, yes, I, I have been um, criticized along with others for being supportive of the mm. administration of Cyril Ramaphosa. Um, I'm supportive, Sizwe, because I feel like the years under the former President Jacob Zuma were a lost decade. I think, and I've done some studies, that it perfectly fits the mold of what a kleptocracy was. And why this matters to me is I think our country has very urgent social justice mm. um, imperatives. Um, employment, health, education, um, in order to, to, to build the prosperity or even the survival of more South Africans, I think is better served by this presidency than the last one. Mm. This has almost got almost nothing to do with the individual, but it has got to do with the promise of a clean government. Because my other big study I'm doing is, if you take that we've lost 1.4 trillion rand to state capture, mm. What was the attention cost of a civil service that was totally distracted by either fighting state capture or enabling it? Sure. Where could our country have been if we'd bought the right trains, for example, if we'd invested all that money in schools rather sure. than on crony networks, if we had been paying attention to the state of our public hospitals, where might our people have been? Further ahead, I do, I do think so. Mm. So it's more about the promise about the administration. Now, there's another political perspective that I'm, I've really come to understand. Mm. I don't think that our uh, democratic well-being lies in the hands of any political party, mm. to be honest. I do think it's going to require a large and active civil society to drive forward mm. um, social justice. Mm. I've really become quite cynical about um, the self-interest of all political parties and of all politicians. Yeah. And I hate that cynicism, but it's been served by 24 years of watching them become mm. more and more self-interested. I must say, from, um, the, from the journalistic perspective and from the media perspective, yes. you definitely do see politics from a very different angle. Um, and certainly on this journey I've been in, mm. it's completely reshaped the way that I see yes. the way that politics works. You know, I think for me, with this kind of, big debate that has engulfed South African politics right now about do we do we believe in the Ramaphosa project or do we not? I think that the difference is not as vast as it seems. I think that in large part it's a it's a tactical decision that people sure. are making. Mm. And my perspective is that the tactical error is allowing the most powerful office in the land to feel like there's enough latitude not to be accountable. Sure. You know, so my feeling is I accept that Ramaphosa is a better president than, than Zuma. I think okay. that's, you know, mm. it's, it's not the highest bar. Sure. Um, and also that the bleeding in institutions, the actual intentional ransacking of institutions has stopped, mm. you know. But I also believe that presidents don't do more than they need to if there isn't enough pressure sure. on them. And so mm. my view has always been, we're giving Ramaphosa too much space to compromise because we're not holding his feet to the fire. Okay. But can I ask yeah. like, yeah. 
What's your view on how do we hold his feet to the fire? Do what we did to his predecessor. Which is what? Which is investigate, which I think has started his wrongdoing. Mm. You know, criticize his, his actions, you know, vehemently and not give him the benefit of the doubt. Okay. And, and then let him prove us wrong. You know, as opposed to, and this, and I accept this is a different approach, which is actually, wait, he needs support sure. because this project is difficult. And mm. if he doesn't have support, um, my only worry is then that he turns around and says, oh, wait, I've got all the support. Sure. I don't I need to act I think we are fast. at that moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think capital and privilege call him Cyril. Mm. And in that familiarity, there's a kind of um, negotiation, there's, there's a, um, there's, there's built in trust and latitude that you're right as mm. journalists we mm. should not be part of that sure i will never call him cyril he mm. is president ramaphosa um and what i've started and is completely not not sexy no i'm not even sure that anybody outside mm. certain circles read it is every time he makes a promise one month later i go back and track what have you done i've seen that so it's called the rama tracker mm. um at Fin 24, mm. we, we do this, mm. and at Daily Maverick, I try and do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And for me, that's what I would choose to do rather than. Mm. I mean, mm. I think we should investigate who gave President Ramaphosa 800 million rand, yes, whatever yeah. the amount is. Sure, and sure. we should watch that they're not getting um, personal benefit mm. from that mm -hmm. money. Sure. But for me, it's rather about the big things. So you ran, so you did a big job summit in October last year, mm, President mm, Ramaphosa. Mm. Where's that gone? I think nowhere. Um, yeah. In October last year, the president announced a series of stimulus measures to get the economy going. I checked six months later, there was progress on two out of eight of those items. Mm, so yeah. that's the accountability work that I sure, want sure. to do. Um, I do think it's vital that we get some answers on who donated to the campaign. Mm. But mm. the bigger, more substantial tracking work and accountability work mm. I want to do is mm. tell me how you're fixing our economy. How yeah. are you fixing our schools? How are you making sure that public hospitals are not hell zones? Mm. Um, because mm. the deepest sadness for me in 25 years of democracy is that private still means good and working and efficient and Absolutely. excellent and public means bad you're mm. going to die here you're going to fail here mm. and i would love it if public meant like scandinavian public great services eh? yeah that's 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 a fair perspective i think i think in general we have allowed ourselves as as a citizenry to allow one promise to replace another and never yes. actually gone back and said okay like is there any accountability for just not reaching? Mm. Because we're not asking people to make the promises. Um, so yeah, I think there is probably a lot more work to be done by all of us in actually... Yeah, but that takes a, a discipline. It, for me, it takes mm. a journalistic discipline mm. because one, you're not going to run with a cool crowd. Sure, and it's not like... It's not sexy. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's not going to be the, head, the headline mm. story, mm. but it is the vital journalistic work of democracy huh? mm. 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 just finally i was watching the debate between mandela and de klerk in 94 no you I, weren't <laughs> <laughs> did you see my hair <laughs> i was like hair. wow yeah. um and i was so surprised to see a young ferial yeah. hafiji there um it just shows how much of a contribution you've made to journalism through through our democracy but I also wondered, sitting there in that moment and sitting here in this moment, what are the things about our society that have disappointed you? And what are the things about our society that continue to give you hope? Sure. So I'll go back a little bit with you. Mm. So I just started at the newly freed SABC. Yeah. And they were desperately looking for a young black woman who could be part of this <laughs> full white panel. Yeah, <laughs> and, well. um, yeah. um, and then, so I guess I was in the right place at the right time. Mm. I, we had one question. It wasn't a debate by any means. You couldn't sure. go back and say, President Mandela or yeah. coming to be President Mandela. What yeah. do you think of? There was a lot um, of applause no, as well. Yes, there was. Um, so I got one chance and I consulted all my friends about what is it I was going to ask. Hmm. Um, 
I don't think he even... That's a fascinating story. Like, yeah. just that decision. Like, yeah. people don't know how much journalists go through. Like, what should I ask? When God, should I, I ask really... Him? I asked... I had lots of political friends. So yeah. I asked all of yeah. them. Um, and I'd, maybe I even asked your dad. I'm not sure. Oh, my goodness. Um, okay. But it was a big, <laughs> long intellectual question. Terrible. I'd ask yeah. him different stuff now. Um, <laughs> but I suppose I can... I would... We've created an open society um, in in the best senses of the word. And I'll tell you some of what makes me proud. Mm. So if you look at countries in the world who are only now applauding sexual orientation rights, the rights sure. for gay people to be married, mm. we've had that for decades. Mm. We have free movement of people. I think we only take note when there are very sad xenophobic attacks. Mm. But on the whole, we are a pan-African country, and that's exciting. We have... A wonderful constitutional court which is our mm. guardian we have a rule of law, law that works yeah. and while you and I may sit here and lament the quality of our national conversation we have a national conversation absolutely and as much as people may not like journalists there are zero journalists in jail here mm. and I pray it always stays that way mm. so for me it's more about the quality of our social democracy how are we going to fix health, education, and maintain our social solidarity system? But there's always things about our country that make me proud and that I wouldn't want to be anywhere, mm. anywhere else. Eh? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your contributions thank to that. You. And it's been great having you on SMWX. I've loved having the chat with <laughs> you. Thank you. I hear you. Thanks for watching the content. Like, share, and subscribe on all platforms. SMWX.co.za to join the WhatsApp channel. And let's build a new conversation for a new generation. Are you, are you?